Satanic Empire, Death Cult, Demons, Lesser Keys of Solomon, Psychopaths, Elite Control Grid, Light vs. Dark, Druidism, Irish Mythos, Latest, Leak Project. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rex Bear. I hope you're having a fantastic day. We have Thomas Sheridan with us, and we dive deep into the black magic control grid that has laced virtually every network of society. Social media, the entertainment industry, sports, Hollywood, music, almost every faucet of life is under some type of spell. Black sorcery, dark witchcraft. Thomas has been researching the unknown, the occult, for decades. Coming from Ireland, he has a completely different spectrum of knowledge to bring to the table for us today here at the Leak Project. We talk about Druidism. We talk about different forms of magic, good and evil. Thomas also brings to the table names of a couple of entities that are extremely powerful, yet dark and demonic. He feels that many forms of the internet today have been taken over by these entities or are used by these entities as a catalyst or medium for what they feed off of, human emotions. I myself have personally been researching mysticism, the unknown, the occult now for over 10 years. Several years ago, I picked up a used copy of the Lesser Keys of Solomon for research. And it was a very negative feeling when I had that book in the house. Very dark, very low vibrational frequency. And I explain that story in detail in this interview with Thomas as well. And he says, never ever buy a used Goetia, even if it's just for study, because there could be some pretty negative energies attached to that. And that certainly made sense. Now, a lot of really cool things about this interview, folks, is the stuff that Thomas brings to the table, although it's esoteric, it's also extremely scientific. And the interview I had with Neil Slade the other day, from brainradar.com where he breaks down the three different parts of the brain, the reptilian, the mammalian, and the super mammalian. This all interweaves together flawlessly. Enjoy the presentation. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine timelord. Become a contributing member at leakproject.com. Make sure to pick up a high quality decal for 10 bucks, free shipping, help support Leak Project, help support freedom. <laughs> All right, folks, we have a real treat for you tonight. We have Thomas Sheridan from thomassheridanarts.com. You can also go to the Thomas Sheridan YouTube channel. Now, Thomas has been researching the unknown, the occult, for years. And the amount of books and films and documentaries and research that he has compiled together just on his website is enough to keep somebody busy for a long period of time. We're going to do our best to get as much information as we can here today at The Leak Project. And it's just an honor to speak with you, Thomas. How the heck are you? Um, great tonight. Thank you, Rex. It's a beautiful evening here in the northwest of Ireland. We're watching the Aurora Borealis coming in over Iceland. Perfect night for the interview. Wow, that's incredible. I've got a lot of Irish roots. I've never been there, but I do have a, a castle out there from some ancestry, old lineage, and I'd definitely like to get out there in Northern Ireland someday. Beautiful landscape out there, and uh, that's great that you get a chance to live out there. So have you ever been to the U.S.? Yeah, I lived in the U.S. for 11 years. Okay, what part? Uh, New York, mostly, yeah. Are you glad you're back home? <laughs> well, I, I love America and I, I love Ireland. It's just that, uh, you know what the biggest problem with America for me was the climate. It was living in New York was very extreme, very cold winters, very, very hot summers. And I don't handle the heat well. So it was, I had a lot to do with it as well. But it was, I didn't leave America for any kind of like negative reason. It was just that Ireland called me home again. These things happen, you know yourself. Oh, absolutely. I, I can certainly appreciate that. I grew up in the mountains and for the past almost 20 years, I've been away from my hometown, home state, and certainly I can't wait to get back there, so I can appreciate that indeed. And if you would, Thomas, just for our audience that hasn't had a chance to hear about you before, if you give them a brief description about yourself, why you decided researching the occult, mysticism, Druidism, etc. Well, 
and specifically with the cult that started when i was about 11 i'm not kidding you i got my hand uh, somehow i don't know how it happened i got my hand on a book of, of magic and magic spells and it was just one of those things as a child that fascinated me it was also at the same time i was very interested in things like astronomy as well and even later on electronics which may sound weird but we can just there are, there are links there too and so it was just something that always fascinated me and then i had like the, the usual stage Growing up, where you're interested in all kinds of paranormal things, ghosts, you know, UFOs, that the whole lot, demonology, all these kinds of things, you enter your consciousness. You read like, every book you can get, and it was all part of a, a thing from day one to day to, to to now to try to understand well what what being alive is, what human, what being a human is, and is this is this software that operates the universe is it hackable, and over the years, I've discovered it absolutely is, and the methodology for hacking this, the software of the humor, the universe is magic. So you got into magic and started researching that. Did you get into a specific type? Uh, you know, I mean, there's multiple types yeah. of magic, obviously, just like math. Yeah, well, I never ever was a member of a magic school or any group like that. But I, the, uh, most of the magic you see, you know, in in the West, in our in our in magical texts, is generally based on you know Jewish kind of magic, the Kabbalah and that kind of thing, the Lesser Key of Solomon, and the Goetia. These are very much sort of rooted in kind of either uh, Middle Eastern Semitic texts, and mm -hmm. so that would be basically my first introduction was learning about things like the Kabbalistic tree and that kind of thing. And I, to be honest with you, it never really hit me because I think, well, mainly because. It was Middle Eastern, you know, ultimately, and it was, it, it, you know, although it is a proven methodology of working, you know, working magic, it it had aspects about it that, you know, coming from the Middle East doesn't necessarily fit into a, a Northern European, you know, body, if you know what I mean, or mind, sure. consciousness. So it, then the idea would be to look at magic in almost like a holistic sense, not so much in terms of, shall we say, practicing a specific school although i do would recommend that to people if they wanted to go down that route but rather trying to find a, pl a, a applicable uh, shall we say ideas within your own culture and this became a very long and almost arduous learning process and eventually it was true ironically the work of you know carl jung's work on synchronicity and his own versions of approaching the unconscious in books like Man and the Symbols, coupled with the American mythologist Joseph Campbell, that combining the two, I started to understand that right, magic was relevant to all, all cultures from very early on, but at the very basic level, there are kind of general, shall we say, tropes, memes, or met methods that are common everywhere. And this led me eventually to looking at the idea of who the Druids were and what they, what you know, what what was their, I you know, conceptual ideas of magical process about, which is my new book. My new book, The Druid Code, is essentially dealing with. But there's various things. There's, there's basically the idea of the sacred space, the magic circle. This seems to go back to a phenomenally ancient part of antiquity. In fact, in France, they've recently discovered basically neanderthal men or people were building inside caves using stalagmites uh, magic circles they found them laid out so there was this idea of creating the safe space or the magical space within the enclosed magical area almost like a shall we say a, a, an aspect of reality that's not in this reality it allows you to step out of this reality in order to focus your will, and that's what magic is at the end of the day. No matter what you can take, you can get, take all the, the theory and methodology and, and all the rule books and everything out. At the end of the day, it's about the absolute concentration of will towards an objective. In its basic sense, magic is taking something in the mind that didn't exist and bringing it into material reality. That could be something as like writing a book, painting a picture, building a chair if you're a carpenter. It didn't exist in the in the, in the real world. You made it manifest all the way up to ritual magic. And the, the ultimate thing is you, they all follow the same general rules. So, for instance, if you want to achieve a, a magical result, say, you know, say you want your, your boss to give you a, a raise at work, you will go into the same process of doing that writing it out on a paper in the form of a sigil, as you would a carpenter who designs a chair and then brings that chair into reality. But when magic really became alive for me is when it became less, shall we say, 
esoteric and more reality based when i say reality i mean in like real world terms when i studied electronic engineering in college i was always a, a mad electronics now i'm talking about analog pre-digital electronics here and it soon became apparent to me that the the, the manipulation of electrons through say an electronic circuitry by creating say a schematic of say the circuit and building it was exactly the same process and then magic stopped being an almost mystical thing for me and becoming a very practical thing and it was almost like in time i developed my own relationship with these magical ideas that was outside the domain of any any theory as such now did you ever do ritual magic as well or do you sometimes perform that on like specific times as well to harmonize with i guess where the stars are aligned etc not necessarily, but I do. I do know it works. I haven't actually taken part in a. In a, I've tried. I've tried several rituals, according to the the texts. And yes, they. they, they you know, they see what this, this idea of the stars being in the sky at the right time. And all these other aspects. A lot of this is all coming down to one thing: the focus of will as an absolute, pure stream of energy. Now, for instance, you will have. You might have. You know, I have a particularly vicious dagger. It's actually an assassin's dagger, and I, you know, I bought it off a gypsy a few years ago. And this thing is absolutely lethal. I mean, I mean, you know, the blade is like eleven inches long. It's self sharpening when you remove it from the sheath, and it, uh, it, it actually is just frightening to even look at. And this, when you pull it, when you withdraw that dagger, you're you're actually putting, you're, you're shifting your consciousness at that moment because it inc automatically increases and amplifies the intensity of the sensation towards what you want to achieve it's about absolute and pure um pure ultimate focus and streams of energy you can do it with a painting i've done it with a painting it all depends on what you are artists for instance and i'm an artist myself generally have a better shall we say a uh, qualification to get into a magical state because the act of creation the act of painting the act of drawing of sculpture is already there for them they're already in that 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 zone where someone who's not artistically inclined or necessarily creative they would absolutely probably have to go through the ritualistic aspects of it such as a daily incantation and so on in order to reach a magical state very very uh, you know useful practice for someone who wants to move in that in that direction but yes, I've tried them, I've done them, and I still find that the that the best way for me to approach it is to, well, is basically true art. I mean, that's what magic used to be called. It was called the art. And uh, I've had experiences in my life, now not deliberately, where I've painted sort of like streams of consciousness and they've come into manifestation as reality. Now, whether I had predicted them or whether I had created them, I'm pretty much more certain that I created them more than I predicted them, although there are aspects of both. But either way, it is, still comes down to the idea of hacking this operating system of consciousness. You know, I'm looking at your YouTube channel right now. I'm seeing the thumbnails for the videos, and I'm wondering, do you put certain presentations together and put sigils, symbols, etc., throughout your presentations to add to the effect? Well, not necessarily, because basically I'll point people in directions of books they can buy and things like that. And I also, it's like it's like anything else. I don't. I tell people to approach all the subjects maturely in a in a rational way, and don't think, don't be frightened of it, don't be arrogant about it, don't be narcissistic about it. Just have a go at it and begin. You know, you know, begin with very basic understandings of how energy works. I'll, I'll give you an example, right? I've written two books on psychopathology. I used to work in Wall Street as a graphic designer. I know very well about how the psychopathic control grid works <laughs> and dealing with psychopaths. That was a good also, one, man. Yeah, I, I, that's, I can tell you, that's, 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 uh, that, it was some education, I can, believe, I can tell you. Now, one of the things that, that actually became a practical, magical thing, and that for me was this, and I actually got it from a Slavic magic text, and don't ask me to repeat it because I cannot, I cannot read Serbian, but it's a long time ago. And basically, it was a spell or a curse to silence a person who was a disruptive individual in a community. And it's basically, it was calling them, it was basically the idea of a living debt for them. So suppose you had someone who was in a town who was causing trouble or was driving everyone crazy. If everyone ignored them as if they weren't alive, they would disappear from town. And basically, 
the idea was to stop this individual, even if they were not malicious or pathological, from harvesting the energy. This became an idea I developed in my own work dealing with these psychopaths, which I called no contact ever again. And the idea of no contact ever again there, there is directly comes out of a magical idea. And the idea that you're working with someone who's, who's a real pain or you're dealing with someone who's really toxic in your life, even if they don't mean to be, what they're doing is they're either consciously or unconsciously uh, harvesting your psychic energy. By ap applying this no contact ever again idea, you immediately cut off the, uh, the the stream of energy that they're trying to harvest from you. So, for instance, if they're trying to get a rise out of you, trying to get a reaction out of you, by ignoring them and not uh, having anything to do with them, you're actually performing a magic spell, a, a very real one. And what you're doing is you're protecting your psychic energy from being harvested by this person who's winding you up. So, for instance, a very troublesome ex-spouse or a troublesome person in your life. By going no contact ever again, even members of your own family are toxic. You can actually save enough psychic energy in you to produce a better outcome in terms of your own quality of life. And, and that's exactly what happens because if you're focused on a person who's negative and damaging to you and your psyche, they, you will never ever have the creative space to do anything else. And it's absolutely very similar to dealing with like almost like a, a demonic manifestation. The idea is to step outside the area where this thing can actually get you. And this is all about the energy. We're caught in this planet. Like the, the Gnostics made a lot of sense when they said this planet was basically a giant prison of sorts created by this 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 like this hyper demon Yo, called the, the Both. Yeah, the Demarouge. And that's basically our truth to that. Now, whether that's literally true and the Gnostics tests can be taken as truth, but that's a lot of truth to that. There really is. And it's almost like a, a hard learning process here. And the, the process that you're, you're ultimately learning all your life is that you're involved in some kind of energy war. And the purpose of this energy war is to, is to survive as much energy as possible to get true life. And things like this, like these kinds of ideas, like these 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 reactions you can rob from pathological people helps to further you deeper into a creative and more magical state that when you can actually break these, these it's almost like there's another energy, a path, well, there is a pathological dark energy in the universe that's trying to disrupt you and your spiritual or your psychic growth. And by learning how to deal with these more effectively, what you actually do is you develop your own magical state much more, shall we say, effectively because you actually have the time and nothing is stealing your energy. When you brought up the Gnostics, I was wasn't going to mention the Nag Hammadi treaties, but, but because you did bring up the, the Gnostics, I want to mention the Archons, and then their chief Archon, archon was named Yaldabaoth. Yeah. Do you think there's some substance to those Archons? Like, are they some type of, is there a parasitic energy force that's alive just like we are, but maybe in a different dimension that literally feeds off of human emotion? Yes, but I'm not completely sure what it is. You can call them archons, demons. Even the what, what, what the in Irish folklore, the fairies are demons. It's only Hollywood that made made the fairies uh, sweet and cute, and Tinkerbell. In to the you know the old Irish people, the fairies are a demonic race. You do everything to avoid. And the same, you know, you can call them what they want. Archon is just a handy term. Okay. Just like just like demons is a handy term. But yeah, absolutely. Now, why are these things? Well, I I, I have I, honestly, I actually go back and forth. I can actually identify two demons that I know that are absolutely real and for sure. That said, the Babylonian entity Pazuzu, there's, you know, that was the one made famous in the Exorcist movie. That was the demon that, that allegedly possessed Linda Blair in that film. Very well done, I might add. The other one would be Quran's on 333, which is, the, which is a, basically a Middle Eastern a deity that I actually believe has manifested on the internet as a kind of a, a pathological force as we approach this kind of singularity on the internet where the, the internet is becoming close to sentient from all the emotional and intellectual energies and all kinds of psychic energy poured into it that i believe that i i, I mean this is like something that I've, I've studied quite extensively and these things are not they, they are they are capable of Lie. I mean, this is the whole thing. They will lie. I often look at Facebook, and I look through the, the Facebook accounts some, sometimes, the fake ones. And I do really wonder if this is some kind of entity and not just like, a, you know, some people say oh, it's a CIA account or it's some kind of corporate account or it's some kind of prostitution account. But when you start look at going into these accounts and communicating with them, you achieve nothing from them. There's no payoff for you. It's almost like these, these are like... Uh, Autonomous complexes within the uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, but there's like th this is you can call them archons, you can call them anything you want, but yes, there is some other energetic conscious force 
uh, that we are in you know dealing with and this you know whether by naming them which they say you should never do but you bring them into reality now a classic example of that would be crowley and awas his own kind of um and you know, entity he brought for well as really as was his wife brought Rose brought forward in in Egypt when they visited the museum there. There's also you know, and he also invoked Quranzon on three 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 in the desert with Victor Newburg, in one probably one of the most astounding acts of you know magic ritual ever. And you know, the, the, with these we, whether we bring these things into re- reality or not, they do exist. Absolutely, they do exist. I've absolutely no doubt about it. And they are and they are deceivers of humanity what that why they do that well i think there's a lot of truth in the idea that they harvest energy from us but they also could be just another race i mean in the irish folklore tradition there's no doubt about that the, the, that the fairies as such they're another another race they're another form of person another one well, not a human but they do exist they they are another uh, another race and so, uh, but they, they're not just, they're not, for some reasons or other, they're not uh, visible to us all the time. And yeah, so absolutely, I do agree there's some kind of, there's something there behind the veil. You know, it's certainly incredible too, because I have noticed things take place that the synchronicities there, I go, man, there's just no way that that is just your typical, you know, event that happens out of chaos. It seems like there's things that orchestrate behind the scenes oftentimes, whether it's my higher self, whether it's, you know, past ancestors that have gone to the other side or spirit guides or whatever. I've definitely noticed stuff like that, especially when I dive really deep into certain subjects. Now, Peronzon 333, I have actually heard about. Could you describe in detail? Yeah, Peronzon 333 is a, it basically it's a, it's a Middle Eastern entity that it's been this, it's you, you just do everything. You would not summon this entity on your own. It's basically, if you were doing it, you're basically tearing open the gates of hell and allowing this thing to come in. You're putting yourself in extreme danger. Edward Kelly, the the famous magician who worked with John Dee, he, he actually compared it to being more powerful than the devil or more powerful than any, any de- if there is such a devil, this Quran's on being, 333 being a more powerful entity. And I would definitely agree with that. Um, when Crowley summoned Quran's on 333 in the desert with Victor Newburgh, the, the ritual was so dangerous, even for you know a master, a master magician like Crowley, that he had to create a two separate circles and one to contain himself while he brought he invoked it evoked the entity and another one to keep victor newberg safe to record the, the event and to also have a knife a, a dagger now the purpose of the knife was to if the quran's on 333 entered into newberg's circle he would have to strike at it with the dagger or even more and, they, and this is even more frightening he may have had to kill himself Imagine that, a magical ritual where you have to, might have to kill yourself so the entity doesn't, act, you don't actually become a kind of, a, your soul isn't stolen to become some kind of worm in its viscera. The, the Quran on 333 is called the Lord of Chaos, Cancer, and Cholera. He's strongly, strongly associated with disease, strongly associated with cancer. And this is a, when he appeared before Newberg, when Crowley summoned him forward, it was a beautiful young lady. This may have also been the same entity that Medimi that appeared before Edward Kelly and John Dee back in the Elizabeth in the Tudor in the Tudor court, and she was a she, Newburg. She she looked like a this is this is the whole thing. They're deceivers and liars. Newburg knew exactly what was going on there. The idea was just trying to get Newburg out of his uh, protective magic circle or to invite Quranzon 333 as this coquettish female into his own. Uh, actually, it went quite badly, and Quranzon 333, according to their, their, their record, manifested into a kind of a, a shall we say, a kind of a, a werewolf bear type entity, which is also, all, you know, commonly manifest, known to manifest as. And uh, Newberg had to strike with it at, with a dagger. Now, the ritual was successful in, the, in that they brought Quranzon 333 forward, but Newberg was never the same person ever again. Even the experience of, this, of the ritual completely. Uh, damaged him as a human being Crowley being made of stronger stuff but he was also in a kind of a a trance state while he was doing this he missed out on the worst of it but that's what that that's what Quran's on 333 is he's a deceiver and a liar he also likes to insult uh, it I should say insult humans and this is what makes me suspicious that it's forming abusive accounts on the internet these 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 accounts make no sense you might see one one profile picture or some other photograph and it basically runs around harvesting energy off the people on the internet maybe even sexual energy by pretending to be a flirtatious beautiful woman so it could essentially be working through the internet as well as supercomputers and software programs 
I would be shocked if it didn't. I, at this stage, at this point in history, in the development of the internet technology, I would be frankly amazed if these entities are not now rampant on social media. What you're saying right now really correlates to an interview I had with somebody that's really good with Gematria. His name's Zachary Hubbard, and whether you agree with him or disagree with him, he certainly knows his stuff about how numbers and letters. And the, the conversation we had was essentially, if you look at a lot of the stuff that's portrayed in the media, at least out here in the U.S., I don't know what it's like in Ireland, but they'll have certain news events take place and they'll say 33 people died 33 people in an accident 33 people got this you know they'll use specific numbers a lot of times and he equates that to essentially the powers that be throwing certain things in our faces and i look at it more also on top of that maybe as harnessing certain energies by creating these numbers and what people think towards that but maybe there's a supercomputer out there that they can calculate these algorithms to get the most effect and I often wonder if it's that or if it's just people that are very smart or maybe if it's something behind the scenes like what you're referring to, this entity that we can't really see because it's outside of our physical spectrum of what we're the visual light spectrum that we have access to. I think it's all those things. I actually think it's all those things. It's a combination of all of them. Uh, you know, the, the, the 33 thing, that's an interesting one. I mean, that's, that's very asso heavily associated with Freemasonry, particularly the Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Now, that's, you know, I, I, you, they, they'll throw that 33 out all the time, it, that, especially in things like politics. I just found out the other day that the, the first time the Irish, the Irish tricolor, the Irish flag was flown, was on number 33, the Mall in Waterford. Now, it was, they, they picked a place called number 33, the Liberty, and that flag was created by the French, the Grand, La Grande Orient Lodge in Paris, which was a free, the, the greatest Freemasonic, you know, shall we say, center in the history of anywhere on earth, very heavily involved in things to this day, even with like even the US Navy, it was very heavily involved in the creation of the United States, both Thomas Jefferson and, uh, uh, Franklin were both in, were both vi visitors to that lodge and heavily inspired by it. Now, so the you know we're dealing with something here that we could we're, we're going into a something more towards esoteria than than magic itself. But ultimately, they're looking for the same things. Yeah, I think it's a combination of all those things. I think it's a combination also that a lot of these the, the power structures, the leaders of the power structures, don't even know themselves what they're doing. I think there's some guiding force. For instance, I was in Switzerland the other day, and I did an interview for the new book uh, right in front of CERN. And uh, you know, the CERN particle collider is just a gigantic magic circle. Whether there's, it doesn't matter if they're scientists and calling themselves scientists, but their pursuit of the say the Higgs boson or whatever the next particle is after that is a magical quest. They may not use that language, but it is, and they're caught up in a magical quest. And all you have to do is look at the photographs of the scientists at CERN, you know, on the, on the French-Swiss border. When when the Higgs boson was announced, the looks on their faces was of religious salvation. These are you can't, no matter how atheistic or how rational or reason a person likes to think they are, we're still driven by magical impulses. Absolutely. And have you studied into Druidism extensively, also? Yeah, I've just written a whole book on Druidism. All of, uh, the reason for that is I, I spent like nearly since I was 11, I've been 30, 30, 40, nearly 40 years studying the megalithic structures of Ireland. Now, where in Ireland is like in terms of megaliths, we're just we're we're just loaded with them. You know, we're just loaded with them. Even as the county that I live here in in in, in County Sligo, this tiny county on the northwest of Ireland, there's 5,000 megaliths. Just put that in perception, 5,000 st standing stones, the stone circles, there's things called barrows and cairns and all these other kinds of, you know, ancient Neolithic structures. Now, in Ireland, we were very, very fortunate that we were never invaded by the Romans, not by Imperial Rome. So we didn't have a destruction of the Druids that took place in Gaul and England and, and in Britain. And Druidism remained a, a potent force in Ireland even long after Christianity arrived. And... As late as the Renaissance, we're talking 1600s, there were still Druids, very powerful in Irish society, although they changed their name by then because they were not allowed to practice religion because Christianity was the prevailing religion by that point. But they were still tolerated, and they, in every other way, they they you know they existed in society as a very real thing, not as a mysterious thing. And coupled with the fact that Ireland has a phenomenal mythological record, probably unique in Europe. In terms of the you know the, the antiquity of it, it's as complex as the Norse legends, but it actually goes back further. And within that, you have endless mentions of druids. You have men endless mentions of druids and their craft, 
right up into the Christian period. You know, when St. Patrick first came to Ireland, he was literally involved in a kind of a weird espionage war with the Druids who were trying, who had basically taken over Christianity in Ireland and were running it for their own benefit before he even arrived. Because they, 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 this is how crafty they were. And this is how brilliant they were. Now, the Druids were not this kind of distant mystical thing. In Ireland, they were a part of everyday life, just like the Brahmins are in, in India. They were very central to life. And they, 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 their magic was specifically geared towards things like transcendental states brought about not through using psychedelics, though they may have, but generally through things like dreaming. They would go in, into dream states. Another thing they would do would be that they would the, the, the bardic aspects of magic, the idea of creating a story or a satire that would destroy even a whole kingdom. One of the early ancient mythological races of Ireland, the, the two of the Danon, the children of the goddess Danu, their, their destruction began when the Milesian Gale druid Amergan stood in Ireland and issued forth a satire, a poem, that basically was a magic spell issuing the end of their reign in Ireland and the rise of the Milesian Gaels, who were the, the Gaelic people eventually took over Ireland. And they, their magic was bardic. It was very much bardic. It was very much based on the idea of the, the, the spoken and the, the spoken word. And that, that's reflected in Ireland to this day with all the poets and, you know, the great writers and so on that we've produced. It directly comes from that. So, there's, you see, this is, this is the to illustrate that magic isn't necessarily the kind of, you know, what you have gotten the Golden Dawn or, or Crowley's Thelema, but also magic can be invoked in, in that sense through things like what they call the art. And in the case of the Druids, very much bardic magic. And was there any connection with, if you look at the Tree of Life, I think that's more Jewish mysticism based on the Kabbalah, but is there any connections with Judaism? Did they ever use any of those chakra systems or analogies? No, it doesn't seem to be. The, if anything, the, the Irish Druids were very similar to the Vedas. It was almost like a, a, a system similar to what you might have had in India, in, in the, the ancient Indian ideas, very heavily rooted in things like a, a, a basic sense of a soul that reincarnates through different, not only different through different people, but different animals. So eventually, the idea is to achieve all the com, all, all all the complexity of life on this planet. So um, that's how you would reach a kind of a god a god state. Now, the idea of the trees were extremely central to the, the Druids. They practiced their rituals inside groves in the woods. This, some trees were very looked upon with tremendous power. The oak, for instance, represented a Druid. In fact, the word Druid comes from the Irish word for Drua, which is oak. And the oak was symbolic for lots of reasons. It it, 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 it had the deepest roots of any tree that, that represents, you know, it's in its tenacity. It can withstand any storm. It also has an ability through the amount of tannin in it to actually withstand vast amounts of fungus. And the only kind of parasite that can exist on it would be the mistletoe. And the mistletoe was also central to the Druidic idea as well, very much so. And so whereas the, the, in the, the Jewish mysticistic, mysticism idea of the tree of life and the Kabbalah, it's more... It's more of a, a a consciousness understanding of the process where the Druids actually applied a a literal sense to it. And this is reflected not only in the Irish Druids, but also the Yggdrasil tree in the Nordic and, you know, that th those kinds of things. The Saxons had very similar ideas as well. The idea of the tree being central to human spirituality is, it, it's key. It's, it's the, but the, the tree represents the, the, the leader, the, the actual practitioner, the druid, the, you know, the, the rabbi, the, the seder in the, Nor the Norse tradition. The tree represents the actual adept. Now, also, if you were to date back as far as you could, the druid teachings, would they go as far as some of these monolithic structures that you found out there and the anomalies in Ireland? And if so, how far back is that? Yeah, there was a belief that they would, like the English antiquarian William Stukeley back in the 1600s, who was the first person to do justice to the megalithic structures of Europe after the, you know, the end of Puritanism, and they were, they were no longer deemed to be like devils this and devils that. And he actually theorized that they were temples of the Druids, and a lot of that had to do with miscalculations relating to the procession of the equinox, but he was a, geni a brilliant man otherwise. And he, he, he that was his theory that the Druids were there. I believe the Druids were at places like Stonehenge and Newgrange in Ireland and all the other, shall we say, sacred sites, Avora in Portugal, Karnak in Brittany and France, 
Callanish up in Scotland. And yes, I believe that, but they, I think they adopted these places. They were already there. Druidism would appear to have arrived out of a, pro, a kind of an earlier proto-shamanic uh, magical tradition. We don't have an, uh, an awful lot of evidence for that. We've found the odd and you know he antler headdress here and there. Though there's problems with dating them, to suggest there was a kind of a a shaman type, a proto shaman shamanistic type of cult before that. I reckon that the the druids were actually more of a product of the Atlantean catastrophe. I firmly believe that Atlantis did exist, and the druids were probably a result of basically Western Europe being destroyed and a new kind of priest class. Who are almost like psychoanalysis, you know, offering an almost a psychoanalytic, analytical healing process arose out of that. So I, I actually think the Druids are probably born in trauma, born from trauma. Now, how far back do you think Atlantis is? Yeah, that's a good one. I think about that all. I think you know, the, you hear people saying there's there's multiple, the the, the eight thousand year thing, the ten thousand year thing is the is the general ballpark. But I think if the, whatever catastrophe took down Atlantis, and I believe Atlantis did exist in the Atlantic, somewhere off the west coast of Ireland, it's what the Irish call High Brazil or Tir It was, it, you know, it was the plain of Vigrid in mentioned in the Ragnarok, the Norse sagas. We do know there's vast areas of Europe, on, of Western Europe, that's now under the sea that was above land as as recent as four or five thousand years ago, and we're finding megaliths all the time in, under the sea, especially off Orkney and Scotland. I. I I found one here in, in this part of Ireland under the bay that had been officially listed as destroyed. It hadn't. It was just under the sea, a, a bit out, a bit out into a bay, and been silted over. And this is this one a standing stone found under the sea, like quite deep down off the coast of Sicily, with carvings on it. So the sea was a sudden sea rise. I think it was a mul it was a multiple thing, and I also think the disaster. Let's say it was a comet or a large asteroid that caused the initial. You know, destruction of Atlantis came back as a recurring event that lasted probably for thousands of years and then decreased in intensity as like whatever the fragments were eventually all either crashed onto Earth and other planets or ended up in the sun where they no longer became a threat. Uh, this was in the Irish mythology. There's, there's all kinds of references to beings that fall from the sky. Lu Lanfada, one of the highest gods in Ireland of the Irish mythology, he's described as being a blazing a blazing god of light with a long trailing arm behind him. I mean, that's a comet as clear as anything. And you have this kind of thing. I would say Atlantis probably did take a pla take place in the the common time frame of ten thousand years ago. But I think it was then it, there, there was one major catastrophe. Then it was recurring attack catastrophes, and causing tsunamis, maybe either other kinds of destructions that lasted probably for another couple of thousand years. Now, could we get into some details on Irish mythology when you talk about the ancient gods and how they come from the heavens or from space? I'd love to get into details with that. I'm sure many of our listeners here at The Leak Project don't have this kind of knowledge because most of us are here in the United States. Now, it's funny that we do have some various two listeners in Ireland, though, and I do want to give a shout out to one in particular, Brittany. Hey, Brittany, I'm sure you're going to be listening to this. <laughs> She's been with Leak Project for a long time. She lives in Ireland. So, heck, man, she might be your neighbor. Yeah. Well, basically, Ireland doesn't have a, a, a hard and fast creation myth, not Irish mythology. There is reference to some Crete, some entity called the Matha, which very sounds very similar to kind of the Hindu ideas of a of a being that was torn to pieces. But it's still that one is still open. Ireland is really a story of invasions. When they call them invasions, they call, they're really mentioning races that came out of other parts of the world or arrived on the island, and they're specifically mentioned. Now, the most significant of them all in terms of this story. Is a group that arrived called the Thruid, the Tuatha Dé Danann. Now, the Tuatha Dé Danann were alleged to arrive in Ireland from four destroyed cities to the northwest beyond the sea, and that so that puts that right in the, the area of the Porcupine Bank, which is probably the, from my if you also if you look at the Nordic route thing as well, probably the 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 the, the location of what you you know Plato called Atlantis, or they would have never called it that. The Irish call it High Brazil. They came to Ireland on a cloud. Now, this has been interpreted as a spaceship. I don't buy the ET thing. I don't buy the alien visitation thing. I think if we're dealing with any kinds of things like that, they're, they're already on this planet. But they appear, they came on a cloud. So this suggests some kind of ability to get to Ireland. They also brought with them four treasures. This, this shows up constantly again in European mythology, right through. And they, they brought these, these what, the most important thing of all, they brought with them the magic and the, and the sciences. They were considered 
tremendous craftspeople that could do things like there was one particular king of Tara called called Nuada who lost his arm in a battle and a druid and this is in the Irish mythological record built him a bionic arm of silver that he, that's just like his regular arm a machine arm there's these kinds of stories there's an entity called Balor of the evil eye who, who battles them and Balor's eye is supposed to admit a ray that's so powerful that it kills anyone that looks on it in fact one day he he, he is eye or we should say was was accidentally uncovered on the island where he lived in Ireland and the ray flew out the back and killed half the life on the Western Isles of Scotland. This is sounding like some kind of incredible energy device. And in fact, Cyclops he, from X-Men. <laughs> what if, maybe, you know, well, actually the archetypes keep coming back over and over again, even in pop culture. They always keep coming back. Makes sense. Yeah. And so what he was slain by this Lou of, Lou of the long arm in a battle, not far from here called the battle of my second battle of my He fell forward and burned a hole in the ground with his eye called Loch Ness, and it made a lake that eventually filled up and became the lake called Loch Nassul, which means the lake of the eye. And this lake is really bizarre. Every so often it just empties. Now, I have had a friend who's a diver who goes, went down into the hole inside it and, would, and brought out for me stones that are actually burnt and mold. They've looked like they've been subject to tremendous heat. Either it was an allegory for a meter hitting the, in the, a meter crater or something hitting it, but at the bottom of that lock are stones that, that are fused together from tremendous heat. So, the, you know, again, it's like Joseph Campbell said, mythology doesn't me mean that they're false stories. It means they're the truest stories of all. <coughs> now, have you heard of the Anunnaki? Yeah. What is your take on them? Don't believe it. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Please. Zach, Zach, uh, firstly, it's, it, it's Zachariah Sitchin's work does not impress me. Uh, for the simple reason, okay, let's 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 ask ourselves why this stuff is popular because of the Bible, right? This is the problem. So we have this mention of the Bible of the you know the the sons of men mating with the these giants or whatever, and Zachariah Sitchin comes out with this thing. He's the only one who can read this cruciform uh, script. Uh, very few people can read it, and he basically comes out with what sounds like a science fiction story. And everyone takes it as literal fact until somebody came along and said, no, he, got, he interpreted it all wrong. And yet that's completely ignored. If you look at the other interpretation of the cruciform scripts, they actually make a lot more sense. Again, they're allegory. People have to understand that an allegory is not literally a description of things that, as they happened. It's a way of almost psychologically dealing with it. Now, I have absolutely, now I, I, don't, I know your show is very big into this stuff and it won't impress a lot of people, but I've seen absolutely zero proof that there's ever been any kind of alien intervention with human beings. And I think a lot of that is born out of this kind of Christian idea of original sin, that there's something fundamentally wrong with humans and we were tampered with or we were affected some way. And I think a lot of that stuff that Sitchin put out there regarding the Anunnaki, 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 if you look at it from the other interpretations from other scholars of Sumerian and cruciform script, you can see that he just basically just took it and, and wrote a great story around it. You know, there's so many different possibilities, and one of the things I appreciate about the Leak Project is, you know, we talk to people on a wide spectrum of topics, whether they have the same opinion or not. I don't want to get everybody on the show that has the same opinion on things. That would, you know, I mean, that I don't really understand where the uh, evolution would be in that. So I can definitely see what you're saying, and I can see what other people are saying. Um, I think that there were some other people that had done translations with the Old Testament in Hebrew, like Marl Bellino. He was a Vatican translator, and he actually, he was with the Vatican for many years, and he, he basically correlated a lot of the stuff that Zachariah Sitchin had said. Now, whether or not that, see, no, but here's where I, I wonder sometimes about the the possibilities, you know, I mean, hum, humankind, are, have we been like this for a million years, a billion years? Have we been tampered with by our own people? Yes. I mean, we know that for sure. You know, I mean, look at, look at the stuff today and people are trying to mess with their own genetics. So maybe yeah. at one point in time, there was a, a, a human race that was just so far evolved from the other guys. And due to chaos and catastrophes or whatever, over a long period of time, they came out of the ashes and claimed to be gods or from another planet or something as well. And then people could say, yeah, I could definitely, you know, okay, I will, I will believe you. But I don't know what to believe. I'm certainly agnostic, and I appreciate what you're saying. I can definitely see that. And, and I don't know, man. I mean, it's, it's certainly mind-boggling. Now, if you look at the possibilities of Atlantis, how it was supposed to be so far advanced at that point in time, then I would think, okay, then how come we have, how come we are so much more suppressed now and our knowledge is like an idiocracy type lifestyle versus what it was then? That doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. 
And you're right about looking at it holistically from all angles, because once you get fixed into one thing, it's dogma. And dogma is the root of this issue here. You have to remember that the, the, the Bible is just basically a bunch of Semitic fairy tales. That's basically what it comes down to. It's only that we've been told that it's important. It's really not an important text in its own right. It's just that we in the West, through the domination of Christianity, as a result of the Roman Empire, have had this thing shoved down our throat. If you go to the, the Vedas, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, you get a whole different version of reality in terms of a spiritual identity. And this is the problem here. And a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the disease that we have in the West, the absolute malignancy that haunts our souls, is the, the initial story in, in Genesis that we had the fall, that we, we were rejected, we were thrown out of paradise by this psychopathic god, the Demarouge, whatever you want to call this thing. This thing, this, this, this beast, this, this, this hyper-demon of the Old Testament that calls itself God. Uh, you know, you actually look at the Bible, particularly the Jehovah Witness Bibles, it actually tells you right there and then that this thing, Jehovah, is not the same thing that created the, earth, the heavens and earth. It just jumps in at one point in Genesis, right before the creation of man, and begins to lie, torture, bully, and destroy them. Now, this, a lot of this comes from this idea, these ideas of the slave species of God. I have looked at enough, say, say, so we say, megaliths and these sites around Europe, and I am, I am astounded by the, the technological achievements for, of, of ancient people. Now, you all know about Baal. We've all heard about Baalbek and the giant columns and stuff like that. Yeah, that's, that's not just one's place. In Brittany and France, there's something called the Grand Menhir, Broken Menhir of El Gras. This was a stone that was carved by people 5,000 years ago, was moved 19 kilometers and stood upright 80 feet tall, a, sim a single piece of stone, and it was dressed and carved, and it remained in situ until it was knocked down by an earthquake about four or 500 years ago, they reckon. How did they do that? We can't do that today. Now, then the people will say, oh, they had alien technology. But this is the thing that really bothers me, is that Adam Eze says that human beings are stupid. You know, we're back to the whole original thin thing again. Human beings couldn't have built the pyramids with our Stonehenge or Newgrange or, or anything like that without early alien help. What 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 a, a self-hating mentality that is. You know what I'm saying? Just because we can't do it now, instead of looking back, you see, because of things like Darwinism, we've been told that our ancient ancestors were were primates, nearly primates and monkeys, Neanderthals, Chroma, these are all like basically, you know, proto-humanoids. And yet they achieved incredible technological achievements. Again, it all comes out of this idea that we're somehow defective as a species. And we are defective as a species, but that happened with the rise of, of, of these kind of Judeo-Christianic cults coming out of the Middle East and telling us we were garbage. Our ancestors didn't have that. We were not, they were not punished by this entity called Jehovah who punished them for nothing just, and then told them they were born in hell, hell for all eternity and then told them they had to be saved. They were already saved. They didn't need anyone to actually save them. They didn't, they didn't have this curse that the, the Christian wor world has put upon Western people. They were free in that sense. So therefore, they were beyond these limitations that were imposed upon the consciousness. They were not under this black magic of being told that they were inferior and they couldn't do these things because they just did them. And how did they did them? Well, that's the great mystery. My belief is there's lots of variables involved in this. For instance, gravity could have been quite different back then, and therefore that would have allowed people to actually move these things. Secondly, there may have been much more oxygen available on the planet, and again, with more oxygen, more stamina, the brain works better, you come up with ideas, and you have more strength to do things. You need less manpower and less resources. These are variables that never get brought into the, this equation, and yet someone always, someone is so quick to come along, oh, the aliens help them do it. Well, it's just it's like saying humans are worthless. That's like basically what that's saying. And I find it, I'm not kidding you, Rex, I find it extremely extremely offensive when I hear people say that humans couldn't do these things because humans did do them. Stonehenge, the pyramids, and all, uh, you know, every, all these other things, they weren't built, built by aliens. They were built by our ancestors. And one of the reasons I wrote the book, The Druid Code, was to try and get this back. To, instead of like, you know, seeing our ancestors some defective monkey that needed to be fixed by aliens, it's time to honor our ancestors' achievements because I'll tell you something, that's the only way we'll ever learn to become that great again. Well, and just think if uh, just a few technologies that could be extremely powerful, whether it be with being able to use magnets or sounds, if you could use specific sounds, because even if you look at everything breaks down to a certain vibrational frequency, which has a specific sound to it. So, you know, if there was a few technologies where you could move things and sculpt things with sound, magnets, gravity, etc., then that could answer a whole bunch of questions on these anomalies that people say can't be explained unless it's alien technology. And I do see a lot of that, and I find it unfortunate because our opportunities and abilities as a human being is so precious, 
And there's so much more that we can do with it. We often suppress ourselves by giving power over to other people. Now, when I look at certain things like big pharma and what they put in a lot of medicines and vaccines and what's in the food supply, the water, and just everything out there seems to be poisoned in some way, shape, or form to keep people suppressed. And I wonder why. Is there just a few individuals that are so scared about us waking up and and taking back what was originally ours that they want to keep us suppressed as best as they can because we're there in this reptilian mindset? Or are are there these demons or devils or all of the above? But I certainly want to find out what it is that's feeding off of this dark ecstasy. It's, okay, we have this psychopathic control grid at the head of banking, government, big pharma, the lot, the works, okay? It's, it, it, even to anyone who had only been arrived on this planet for five minutes ago, that had become apparent very quickly. The whole purpose of the keeping us this way is to so they can stay in power. <coughs> Excuse me. It, you know, that's really what it's about. They're, it's the emperor's new clothes thing. It, you know, if we were to actually realize and to point out that, you know, Bill Gates, here's Bill Gates, right? Here, here, here's a quite an insane individual who's building seed banks up in the North Pole, who has every, wants to get involved in the education system, uh, wants to fix humanity. But yet, when I see Bill Gates, I, I see someone who is just not, I mean, not a full human being himself. There's some serious, it's almost like he's, he, ha, he has like some kind of pathological autism. And yet here's a guy who can't even fix himself, and yet he wants to, shall we say, project that upon the rest of us to make us perfect. And this has been a story all through history. We've seen that all the time. There's a certain element of dysfunctional aristocrats. Today, they're just they're, they're done by money. But in the past, these dysfunctional... Look at the British royal family. I mean, these... these you know, you look at someone like Prince Charles. It's like, does that look like some kind of elite bloodline to you with the big ears and everything? And you see, they all look like that. They're all a mess from all this, that centuries of inbreeding. But yet again, they're all obsessed with, like, controlling us and getting us all into little... as being kind of robots, units in a machine because they're driven by, like you said, the reptilian complex in their brain, and they're extremely fearful, extremely fearful. And this is, this is black magic. They want to, people, people want to know what black magic is. That's what black magic is, controlling someone else against their will. That's what it is. Now, sometimes you might have to do that to survive, but to do it on a global scale the way they do, it's born out of fear and nothing else. And it's not that they, they know we're divine creatures or anything like that. They don't think like that. It's purely like a prison guard. That's really what they're like. They're a prison guard. A prison guard maintains his, 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 del- his delusions of being better than the prisoner simply because of the prisoners are behind bars and he's got a uniform. Other than that, they're still human beings at the end of the day. That's the same thing with them. They have to maintain this, uh, maintain this illusion within us. Now, <clears throat> yeah, this is, this is what's, what's feeding that energy. Where is it going somewhere? That's an enormous question. And I think there's definitely something true with it. Whether the energy is going into these demonic forces or these kind of like uh, forces outside this reality, that's one question. But the real thing, I'll get right back to the beginning when I said no contact ever again, is to keep us rattled and anxiety risen, ri- ri- you know, ridden. So we never actually live to our full potential. We're too busy trying to survive inside the artificial system that they have created for us. This is where I would also be p- tell people about the idea that there's going to be a great awakening. And that's all going to end one day because that what's another distraction. Because rather than you taking control of your own life, you're waiting for some kind of event to happen. This is what cults do. Like cults a carrot tell at the end you, of the stick, right? Exactly. This is what cults do. They tell you, oh, one day the space brothers are going to come and save us. One day the comet clusters are going to come and we're all going to move into the fifth dimension. We had a 2012 nonsense there a few years ago. We're going to have a second planet and all this, this crap that they put out there. This is this is all part of the witchcraft, the the, 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 the dark witchcraft, the dark magi. Is it telling you just hold that? Yeah, yeah, things are messed up. Don't worry. But there's going to be a great awakening and the human race is going to get all 100 monkeys, human resonance. And oh, so you don't have to do anything. No, if anyone listening to this tonight wants to defeat the system, immediately give up on the idea of a great awakening and start awakening yourself. Because it's going, if it's ever going to happen, it's going to happen from individual to individual. And you, can, you have to do that by taking control of your own life. And what you're basically doing is building your own magic circle here. Your own magic circle of protection. That way you can live in the system inside the matrix, but you're not a slave to it. You, you, your consciousness is outside. It's like that movie, The Shawshank Redemption, where he said, like, even though he was in prison, his mind was already free. It's the same kind of idea. 
that's that's the solution. Not waiting for some you know some guru to tell you that it's got one day we're all going to get off our, our off our knees and, the, and we'll rise together as like the hundred monkeys. That's all nonsense. That's all part of the distraction. That's no difference in like giving you sports on TV all the time and X Factor, or waiting for some kind of liberation from above. Salvation always starts from within as an individual process. Well, you know, I've also realized they keep not only people in that opportunity of thinking, oh, you know, we're going to be saved. There's going to be this galactic wave of light and we're all of a sudden going to know everything Mm -hmm. and we're going to be able to take over anything that suppresses us. It seems like the media, the powers that be are really good keeping people in this fear factor mode, thinking that, okay, tomorrow could be uh, planet X is going to arrive. The next day after that, the stock market collapsed. The day after that, the internet could be shut down. The day after that, all nuclear reactors could go into meltdown. And I myself worry about those things sometimes, but do I... Do I give it so much energy as to where I'm going to push it over the edge to where that's going to happen? I sure hope not. I keep myself aware of it and hope for the best and prepare for the worst. There has to be that balance there. There's a, there's a term in clinical psychology called gaslighting. And this is a, what psychopaths do to their victims. They play mind games on them. And they, ta- they put them in a false reality where they don't even trust their own opinions anymore. And we are being gaslighted constantly. To the point where many people don't know what if uppers down, and we see like gaslighting specifically with this horrific cultural Marxism and political correctness that's, that's formed upon people, where they're afraid to make a comment in some case someone finds it offensive. They're afraid to have normal interactions with members of the opposite sex or other races or religion for fear of being, you know, causing some kind of transgression, some kind of crime, some kinds of hate crime by being completely innocent. This is terrifying stuff. And we, this is something we must immediately cast off. This is pure emperors has no new clothes thing. And this is a, this is a, a wickedness that m- must be cast off. But back, Rex, let's bring it back to where this all comes from. It comes from that Middle Eastern death cult called Christianity. Do what you're told and you'll be saved. Play the game in the system and you'll get a pension. Don't offend anybody with an honest opinion and you'll be safe. You might end up killing yourself on SSRIs or blowing your brains out one day after you've like a life has fallen apart for the 50th time, but don't do anything. There'll be a reward. There'll be a payoff. I mean, this is why I consider Christianity to have been the greatest catastrophe that ever affected the West. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these three religions of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, the Abrahamic religions, but maybe they only work in the Middle East. They don't work. They don't seem to work in the West. I mean, I come from a country that was torn too by religion or the same bloody religion as well. And again, this is all, and, and they're not even our religions. They were brought here from the Middle East, for God's sake. And this is a, this is the thing you see time and time again. If you start looking at so many of the things that caused the, the misery of this world, they come back to the same, the same monotheistic Abrahamic infection from the Middle East that's been put into people's minds. And that's you know salvation, reward, punishment, original sin. That can all be the, the, you know distillated down to those same original ideas. These are curses that have been put upon us. Now, not the same. There's good things in that stuff, of course there is. But that we we we're too. If we were to sit back and and actually examine our lives, like even things like there's going to be a stock market collapse. What's that? Divine punishment. There's going to be a bowl of virus. You know, what divine punishment? And the, mass, the mainstream media pushes this stuff out, but the, the alternative media, which should be the one that questions it, loves the doom. Oh, God, do they love the doom. And they run right into it. They can't wait for World War Three. They can't wait to be wiped out by this, that, and the other. And instead of the alt media turning around saying, what is this crap? Why are they pushing this like end of the world stuff on us? This spell, this dark magi spell. They, do, they completely get fired up and start believing it. And why? Because of Christianity. Well, you certainly brought up a good point at the end there about how a lot of alternative sites out there will just feed off of the fear. And there are some good ones out there. I I certainly think that here at The Leak Project, we do our best to keep it as neutral as possible so people can make up their own decision and not push any one agenda. Like, for example, there was a a podcast I did a few weeks ago where there was an article that re resurfaced essentially saying that a chemtrail plane was shot down over China on its way to spread some genetically modified swine flu virus in Ukraine. And it was supposedly Mossad that shut it down. And the person that sent me this article, I I was like, you know what, this sounds to me like a a PSYOP campaign. So I did some research and found out that exact same article had been reposted several times over several years. (laughs) And, you know, I mean, that's that's what happens. You get a lot of these people out there that think they're doing the right thing, yet they're just feeding into this system of of this lower vibrational frequency. And when you can when you can get outside of that and start questioning things, saying, okay, why are they feeding us this much crap? If we've been lied to so many times in the past with the media, why am I going to believe it now? What's any different now versus two years ago, four years ago? It's a cyclical process. And I love how you're bringing up this 
this magic, essentially this dark sorcery that's being played because that's what it is. Whether people oh, yeah. believe it or not, they don't have to believe it when the people that are doing it do believe it. <laughs> so yeah. it's really what it comes down to. You can believe it or not. It doesn't matter to the point of if they do and you're a part of the system, if you're a part of that ritual, like turn it on a TV show or watch a movie. If you feed into that system, well, you're, you're a part of the ritual in my opinion. Well, let me give you an example of that, and I'm very, I'm delighted to hear that you, you you're actually practicing these kinds of what well, should be proper journalism. Check your source. Rule number one: that's never changed. But there's not enough of that in the alternative media, sadly. It is also the, the clickbait thing goes on as well, and that's, that's that's I'm delighted to hear you say that. That's refreshing. I'll give you an example of this kind of thing in real time. At the moment, and Facebook, I have found to be a phenomenal resource source for basically studying behavior. And uh, probably I'm doing what Zuckerberg and the rest of them did at the creator for, but I'm actually using their own magic, magic, their own sword back at them. And it's allowed me to understand things. Now, yesterday was a very strange day. There was, you know, I found the weather was very intense. There was these bizarre dark clouds rushing in from the Atlantic. Sorry, rushing in from the other side, from the, from the east. And it had almost like this, this, this biblical end time kind of vibe about it, like a really bad painting. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's kind of interesting. You don't like the clouds are really like long black fingers moving at you at speed. And then I went online and someone had asked me about doing a podcast on the demon Pazuzu. Now, the, P the Pazuzu comes as the wind and it comes from the east. It comes from the east. And so I thought, that's kind of interesting. And then all over my news, my, my Facebook page. People, there's two things suddenly started happening. I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook, and I follow quite a lot. I just use it as a good kind of data mining thing, just to see how trends are developing. And immediately I saw what I can only describe as the demonic infection taking place on the Facebook news feed. The first thing that happened was people were posting pictures of the demon Pazuzu statue. I don't know why they were they were mentioning it, mentioning the movie The Exorcist. They were just, it just showing up for some, some reason. And then... For no apparent reason, Facebook was flooded with horrific images of children from the Middle East killed in the conflicts there with their brains hanging out. There was all posts about animal torture. And immediately I could see what was happening. A, this sort of like this Pazuzu archetype energy force had swept over literally maybe my consciousness in terms of how I was perceiving it, but also through like the people on the Internet. And 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 I mean, on my Facebook yesterday was the twenty eight. Sorry, the twenty ninth. Today's the twenty ninth. The twenty well, it's it's the thirtieth now, but the twenty ninth to the twenty eighth of September two thousand and sixteen. I, I tell people to go back and look at your Facebook uh, feed, news feed that day, and your social media. It was flooded with people posting nonstop images of horrific acts of violence against people and animals, and that's an that's an example of this energy, this dark magi, this dark force in maybe accidental collusion, who knows, with these these demonic archetypes, filling our world with horrors, filling our world with, as you said, the low vibrational, I think it's a, I always thought it was a very good term, term that, this low vibrational energy to actually smash us down and to psychically feed off us to the point where I stopped looking at the Facebook wall, just turned, turned the computer right off. I went no contact with it right then. And this is something when you develop into a kind of a magical worldview, you, you start to see how the dark magi function. In fact, I have a friend in England and he woke up only a couple of years ago and he went through the initial woke up stage. First, he believed that all the that, you know, that, that all the stuff is put out there by the, the, you know, the big names and all media. Then, like, he starts to develop a more kind of a prosaic and, shall we say, filtered view of it. Very healthy. He got into the kind of new agey kind of end of it. Went off on that. I just he's a nice guy. I like him a lot, and I watched. I just watched him kind of evolve, and now he has this rage. He doesn't even know it because I've never spoken to him about it. But I, I watch him on Facebook, and he's developed this this razor sharp, should we say, magical ability, a magical state. Where immediately yesterday he noticed what was going on too, and he posted on his wall. Why is my wall being suddenly filled with these images uh, of people posting animals being tortured? you know, horrific scenes of children mutilated in Middle Eastern wars, beheadings and all this. And uh, he said, what kind of, it's just, he started saying, I'm starting to think that there's some kind of demonic en en energies uh, possess people through social media. 
And I, I never prompted him on that. I never even spoke to him about that on that. But here he was, and a few others have figured this out already. And that to me is, it, you know, people think the Great Awakening is waking up to that we're going to all be wonderful. And when you wake up, I mean, it, this is very much a Jungian thing that you've got to awaken the shadow too because the dark side is what allows you to see the right side because the deeper the shadow, the brighter the light. So when you do see like the base things like this, you take the approach that like it's happening because it's been triggered by something very powerful. It's just like when you, when you do, I'm sure Rex, it's happened to you. When you've gone into these things, you've noticed some very bad things may happen in your life. At the time you're saying, why is this happening to me? And then later on you realize that it was actually kind of almost like an initiation. If you can get to this, you'll get to a, ne a next level where the synchronicities will be even better and your path is easier. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And I watched, this, I watched this happen to this guy, this friend of mine in England, in that way, just by observing him. He unfolded. It's a, he actually grew his, 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 his subconscious mind and his psyche through observation rather than reaction. So on, instead of being allowed himself to, be, to see these things and react to them, to be swept up in it, to be swept up in the hate with them, be swept up into disgust, he simply observed. And when he observed, that's when he started to see with a real vision. That's fascinating. Now, would you say, that, this is a little bit off topic, but you were discussing earlier about how you think that oftentimes we give ETs way too much credit, and I would agree with that. But at the same time, I certainly believe, in my opinion, that there is... There's beings out there just like us in the universe, probably some that are on a different path that are maybe further as far as technologically advanced and those that are more native, like you know, like the Native Americans working with the land. Do you think that there's other life out there in the universe also, or do you are you kind of shut off to that possibility? No, I think that just by statistically alone has to be. I mean, it'd be very weird to think we'd be the only It'd be kind of frightening to think we'd be the only <laughs> one. No, I th yeah, logically, statistically speaking, yeah, of course, there must be. But that's, that, that, then we, that's a huge mistake people make. Then they say, oh, they've automatically been here on Earth. I have never seen any, and, and I have looked into this deeply. I think there's, I've seen absolutely no proof there's ever been aliens on this planet. Now, you can mention all the things you want, but if you, there, there's, there's some, you know, I'm very suspicious about them. A lot of people have pushed the alien thing over the decades. I think a lot of it is, mili is, a, is a thing for hiding black, black ops, um, new military projects, secret, secret programs. A, a huge amount of it was based in the Nazis and uh, when they came to America with a project paperclip. As soon as they arrived, that's when Roswell and all the other stuff started happening. And yet no one seems to put the two and two together with that one. And also, uh, I think that also there, I think, ironically, the best book ever written on flying saucers was written by Carl Jung in 1948. And he basically said when they were, they were born of the human psyche in the atomic age, when the atomic bombs were, were, went off, that's when the, the humans started to visualize salvation in the form of aliens from another planet rather than angels. And I think that was bang on. And I think there are interdimensional beings, and I think a lot of them may be involved in this as well. But I don't, I've never seen any proof of flying saucers or UFOs as craft from other, other galaxies coming here. Now, there's, there's lots of like, things people point to, but that's, they're not conclusive proof. They're not, they're not even very, very good proof. And prior to, prior to Roswell, nobody really spoke about beings from other planets. I mean, this is like, why? Because it grew up in the science fiction age. You know, it's, it grew up as a, prior to that, it was, it was spiritualism and they believed that they were their dead uncles and their dead aunties. Prior to that, it was angels. Prior to that, it was the jinn, leprechauns, fairies, whatever you want to call them. I find that those much more, human beings will always put the, the, the modern idea on that, you know, the mod, before the aliens, it was a belief that they were travelers from the past coming in time machines. This was a, this was a common belief. We're, we're all, these things have only been created. I'll give you an example, the whole idea of reptilians. That only exists because David Icke saw the VTV, the VTV show back in the 1980s. If that show on, uh, was never on, he would, have, he would have come up with that theory. It's purely related to pop culture. The reptilian agenda, too, that's another fascinating theory. And you see some of those old statues that are thousands of years old of these giant reptilian beings. And maybe they came up with that just from their own psyche. Some people speculate they're from the inner earth. You, you, the first one you said it bang on that it's not just reptilian beings there's, there's half humans half bulls half fish half people half bird half people how come they're all they're all you know they're they're all genetic you know, engineering <laughs> back in the day well, they're asked no they're aspects of the human psyche they're, like the minotaur represents the 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 the, the, the crushing of rages within inside people serpents represent wisdom cunning stealth 
things like these are aspects of human psyche that were represented in, in allegorical art. If you, if you, you know, the problem with a lot of these researchers who talk about these, they haven't studied art and symbolism well enough. They think they have, but they haven't. They're not literal interpretations. They're they're manifestations of the psyche presented in a kind of an anamorphic or zoomorphic form. Yes, there's those images of half reptilian, half human beings, but there's also bird men, fish men, bull men, horse men, senators, minotaurs. They're, they're, how come they're all, we never, we never talk about them? It's because simply because the reptilian thing. Now, I will say this, the reptilian thing of the brain and the reptilian cortex, that doesn't let necessarily mean there's a, a reptilian inside us. What there is is there's a part of our brain that's basically has been given the term reptilian brain because it, it deals with the lowest aspects of our existence, F flight or fight, survival, procuring food and reproduction. And yes, yeah, so that, 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 that's those that, that we, our ancient ancestors knew we had these aspects inside us and that's why they created that art. Now also, it's, since, it's, oh, go ahead. No, I'm just, I'm just going to symbolize that. Now, while we're talking about the different aspects of the mind and different archetypes, etc., I'd really like to jump into the lesser keys of Solomon and the Sidzil magic within that book. I've actually, I used to have a 1913 copy of the lesser keys of Solomon, and I'm telling you, I'm glad I got rid of it because I picked it up on eBay. The day that I got it, the entire house just felt different. It felt like this very dense, kind of like just, you know, real dark. Yeah. And I kept it for a, for a few weeks, and I finally said, look, man, i got to get this thing out of the house. So I just gave it away, and I noticed immediately when I got rid of it that there was a different feeling in the house. And the person that was living with me at the time didn't even know that I got the book. And after I got rid of it the, the same day, she goes, you know, it just feels different, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel lighter in here? And I said, yeah, it does. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it did a very wise thing. Never, ever buy secondhand magic books. And never, ever buy the, the Lesser Key of Solomon under Grisha, ever. That, 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 this is a book that's purely concerned with demonology and the summoning of entities. It has no other function. So if you bought an old copy of that, that was, and that was owned by someone who actually did these rituals, the energetic resonance would be left within those pages, within the actual thing. You could, have that with, you, know, you could have that with any kind of religious book, but with that element specifically, you're going to get all the, if it was actually used, and the fact that you said that it had that energy, yeah, is is indicative that it was used in serious rituals, big time. You you could have got another copy from the same year that was never used, and it wouldn't have the same energy. This is why I always say to people, don't unless you know what you're doing and you're psychically fit, and you, you live alone, you don't have children in the house or things like that. Don't ever buy these old secondhand books, these old secondhand magic books, because you don't know who had them. You know, remember like. In the past, a lot of nasty people, a lot of wicked people, wanted to learn magic to do wicked things. And they will leave their psychic footprints in these books. They weren't like pursuing it from an artistic point of view or to understand esoteric scientists. They definitely they, they wanted to summon demons in order to destroy people, uh, get money, get sex, whatever. So you did it, you did it. I've heard that story many times. You're not the first person. Now, what would you do for some, you know, like, or say to people that have gone through that experience and say maybe they're a little bit nervous about still having some type of resonance from that energy, a way to, to cleanse it and get rid of it completely? Uh, well, if you know someone who is actually a practicing magician, give it to them because they'll be okay with it. Someone has a long history of it. It won't, it won't affect them. Don't give it to someone you don't like. Uh, if you can sell it, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no harm, especially if it's a valuable book. I heard one story of someone who actually, wait and hear this one, put it in, you know, like those styrofoam freezer things you take on a camping trip that like keep beer and sodas cool, yeah. you're feeling full of ice. They put it in the middle of one of them and poured it full of concrete and buried it in a beach. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Entombed it for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it like, depends on whatever, but like, I, you know, my first option would be to find someone who would want them, who would be actually, you know, would be safe with them. I wouldn't have any problem with selling them either. Because it's not you wouldn't be doing any bad, but I certainly wouldn't give it to someone I liked. Right, of or course. So, or someone innocent, you know, someone sort of like energetically innocent. Yeah, that's pretty interesting that something like that could hold on to that, that much energy for that amount of time. It, it certainly makes you wonder. And then when you go to some of these higher levels, and I hear stories of, you know, Douglas Dietrich, he's a whistleblower. He, he talks about how Roswell is all this, like, satanic agenda, essentially, and those little green men or those aliens, what most people thought they were, were actually Japanese prisoners of war. And, you know, I mean, whether you, whether you want to believe that or the other story or none of the above, he brings it to the table, 
in a sense. It's like <laughs> you almost can't not believe him because he's just so passionate about it. And you can tell the way he talks about it. And, and if what you're saying and what he's saying is true, then it makes you question even more of the conspiracies out there and think to yourself, have we just been duped on everything? And are they just feeding off of our emotions at a grand scale? I mean, look at the media today, yeah. the sporting events that take place, how much energy is put out into some sporting events as well. It's just, it's, inc it's incredible. Yeah, it sounds endless at the moment. Like it's like I can remember, like growing up here, you'd have s soccer or rugby. That uh, would be the sports people watch here on a Saturday and a Sunday, right? That'd be it on the TV. Now it's on every night of the week, every night of the week. It's just this is a curfew. It's a passive curfew. To keep them indoors, to keep them from socializing, to keep them from meeting, to keep them from having you know, the, it's a way of keeping a curfew. Things like, and again, this is a dark sorcery aspect to it. These things like Pokemon Go where people are like grown adults are running around like clowns chasing these Pokemons with their, with their mobile devices. That's a curfew. That's, a, that's also a data gathering thing. But it also, they're laughing at people when they see them doing that. There's some, well, they, I laugh at them too, but that, that's literally what, the, you know, X Factor and all these things. People like, people like Simon Cowell, are, are they're, they're like they're like almost like you know here's someone going on a, a horrible magician was like he's a horrible man Alistair Crowley was a horrible man because he did this and that but Simon Cowell is worse he keeps millions of people indoors and watching mediocrity and sitting there playing judge jury of execution over people's lives and dreams and he's considered a great guy this is the kind of nonsense that goes on people start looking at the world in more mature terms instead of looking for the you know instead of looking for you know, you know, the sports on every night. Why is the sports on every night? Well, they want to keep me indoor and they don't want me to socialize. It's as simple as that. Absolutely. And ever since I saw the film Braveheart, I just came overnight huge fan of William Wallace and whether or not the media spinned him the right way or the wrong way. In that movie, certainly the archetype of William Wallace is incredible. And I told you, I've got lineage in Ireland and Scotland, mm -hmm. and I don't know a whole lot about Ireland trying to break free from the from England, essentially, but I know that there was a real close vote last year, right? Could you tell us about that, and what was your thought on on that whole event? Well, that was Scotland that we're going for independent. Ireland is already independent, but like, well, mo most of Ireland is already independent. A small part of the north, so Northern Ireland it belongs to the UK, is part of the UK. That was Scotland that that vote was. And some people say it was rigged. Just about every Scottish person I know <laughs> right? voted yes. And yet, uh, it, it still went through as a no. Uh, again, they played on people's fears. They said things to people in Scotland like, oh, you know, if you leave the Great Britain, uh, you want your economy will fall. Like the usual crap they play with people's minds to make them afraid of change or anything like this. And then they polarized the debate. They, they, they almost, they, they, as they normally do, they said, you know, it's only Catholics in, in Scotland who want independence. The Protestants are fine. So they tried to stoke up sectarian issues like they did in Northern Ireland back in the day. And so, yeah, it's a, it, look, the only way anyone ever gets out of the British Empire is by war. The only reason Ireland won its freedom is because they started killing politicians and, you know, going to war. That was the only reason we got it. When they was that? They, 1922. They wouldn't, that was when the Irish, well, Irish and the war, war of Independence started in 1916. The, the British were gone by 1922. And uh, it was just, it was just killing. It's just the only way to do it. You, you know, I mean, it, we had some very clever people who said, we just have to start killing basically politicians and stop shooting soldiers and then we'll get the result and instantaneously they did they're perfectly happy to send their own their troops over to get killed but when the politicians get a taste of their own medicine they, they collapse very quickly you know it seems like ireland has kind of been the red-headed stepchild for so many years uh, to some of these you know aristocratic globalists and it's really there's so much history and amazing things that have came from ireland have you noticed that as well i mean i look at the native american cultures that have been systematically destroyed around the world and you know it seems like ireland is kind of in a class of its own also yeah we you we will never be we we don't we're, we're different you know, like I was, I was talking to some an American friend the other day about there was a, a library closing around here, and they're shutting down the libraries. And they said, she said, if the, if there's an internet petition, I'll sign it. And I says, no, we, we don't we don't sign internet positions in, in, in petitions in Ireland. We go down and terrorize politicians in, in government buildings. Where we're, we've got a phenomenal and one of the things I really do appreciate about my country is the fact that we have a terrible distrust for government, even our own. We don't trust politicians. They, a couple of years ago here, they tried to bring in this, like, make us pay for drinking water, saying it was rare. I mean, it rains most of the, most of the year. <laughs> but, and we were already paying for water through different kind of, like, you know, regional taxes. 
And it basically, they almost, they, they, I mean, the people literally took, took down the government. I mean, it, you had like incredible like demonstrations. You know, it's just like, don't lie to us. Don't cut, treat us like fools. And there is something in the Irish disposition, wherever it comes from, that cannot, uh, it, will, it cannot be brought to respect politicians. It would just, and that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. It's like uh, we, we, we distrust, you know, governments, even our own, we distrust them. We just don't, you know, we just cannot be controlled. I mean, Sigmund Freud said that the Irish were the only group in Europe that you, the psychoanalysis wouldn't work on because we were different. I don't know what it is. I mean, we awesome. are different. I don't know what it is, but we are different. I mean, we're definitely a lot more freer than most of Europe. I mean, I travel all over Europe. I say the Mediterranean countries are quite free. So you Spain, Portugal, Italy, there's a lot of freedom in those places, Greece. When you go to Northern Europe, Scandinavia, they're, they're such deeply controlled societies that when I get back, I was even in Switzerland the other day, when I get back to Ireland, I feel like I'm, I, I'm, I've entered freedom. People here are far more easygoing and free, free in their, they, you know, they don't obey rules, you know, to the point where they destroy their lives. They, they'll obey common sense rules, you know, but they won't obey rules that just they, you know, to be controlled for the sake of it. And I think that with the Icelandics have that as well, but they're half Irish anyway. But that, that, that's a good thing. And I think that was what, you know, the initial immigrants to America, and many of them were like Irish and Scottish and even like English ones from the north of England. And they had that, that attitude as well. And, you know, it took a long time. You know, that's where the American kind of spirit originally came from, was from that. And then that was kind of broken down by like, you know, extreme forms of capitalism and America had to become an empire and so on. But I mean, that, that's a good thing. And I think, you know, it, the, you know, that's the, the, the movie. Yeah, the archetype of Braveheart of William Wallace, that's, they're very important things. We should never lose sight of them. In Australia, have Ned Kelly, who was the outlaw there. And he's like, he was like the, he's now a national hero there. He was like the one who stood up against the police. And um uh, these kinds of things, you know, they, these are these are these are the things we have to reach into inside ourselves. We have to tap into these archetypes inside ourselves. It's like what James Joyce and, and Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell called the monomyth that every day of your life you have to live like a hero. That if you survive another day in this this psychopathic control grid where they bombard us with all kinds of like dark mag magical powers from endless sports to terrifying news stories to the latest virus that's going to kill us to the end of the world is coming tomorrow. If you can survive that and be happy at the end of the day, well, you've won a victory against that. And there's no difference between that and taking out a sword and slaying them. You know, and it's, it's, you've done it on, the, on the, most, the most powerful level of all, on the, on the level of the psyche. Because I've been saying forever that if there's such a thing as the Battle of Armageddon, it's going to take place in human consciousness. And the only way you can win any kind of war against a great superpower, and that's what we're up against, a gigantic dark magi superpower, is as insurgents, as in an underground guerrilla war. And that's the way you fight in your mind. You don't let them get in there. You don't wait for a great awakening or a revolution. You start fighting immediately inside by having no engaged, refusing to let them pollute your mind and to take away, you know, take away the song from your heart. And also, I've noticed over the past year, year and a half, the flat earth theory has just really taken the Internet by storm. Personally, I've done enough information you know research into this i've even got a close family member that built vacuum tubes for john glenn when he went around the world and these vacuum tubes were actually used for a camera i've seen the vacuum tubes i've talked to him personally i just interviewed him uh he's almost 90 years old he was around when project paperclip first started and and just the stories that he told he owns patents on night vision technology very brilliant man and he would build these tubes from scratch literally and i get so many people in the comments section saying rex why don't you do a show on the flat earth rex come on you do shows on everything else but you won't do one on the flat earth why is that and i think that that would be causing more of a more of a idiocracy type and feeding into this psyop but that's just my opinion maybe if somebody if they can bring me some solid evidence but when i got family members saying they built vacuum tubes and have seen the actual video footage of the earth being round it's kind of hard to want to do a show on the flat earth but you write about that extensively the flat earth thing is a disgraceful psyop and people should be ashamed of themselves for falling for that yeah, we know NASA has all kinds of corruptions. Yeah, we know the space race and the Cold War had all kinds of nonsense attached to it. But, I mean, for God's sake, the Vikings knew the world was courty. When they sailed between Scotland and Iceland, they used to see for how far the mountains and the Faroe Islands were above the horizon to calculate the distance from them. They knew how far closer to them the mountains came up further off the horizon. Further away, they sunk down below the horizon. 
I mean, people have always known the earth was round. It was never, it's only, it was never not round to, to, to most human beings. And it's, this is, the way this, this flat earth thing happened overnight, it was almost like a product launch. The same with this new, other, have you heard about this new thing about this note, the tree, the trees are all, mount, the mountains are all big trees that were put yeah. down. <laughs> I mean, what, what and, and they show like flat top mountains, like uh, what you call that one in America, uh, Devil's Tower. Right. So what, they, they had a chainsaw the size of a city. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And these things appear overnight from Russian sources. You know, no one can verify who they are. They, they arrive almost as products that have just been launched and are absolutely been created by the intelligence service to make all forms of alternative knowledge and alternative research look nuts. And shame on any of you who have fallen for the flat earth thing. You really, you have no right to be calling yourself an open mind or anything because it's, it's clear as day. I, you, even without, even without getting into a spaceship, there's so many things that, that verified like the Coriolis effect and you shoot a gun, the a long range gun and, and the bullet will not hit the target because the earth is rotating. I mean, it's endless things like that. They say, oh, you, how does water form into a sphere? And then you just have to look at all the footage from, from everything from Skylab to the ISS of the, the astronauts taking the water out of, the, out of a container and it forms into a perfect sphere in, in zero G. It's ridiculous and it shouldn't be tolerated. And I know I'm not being putting down free speech or anything like this, but it's a distraction from what needs to be talked about. Well, that's what I see it as, is a distraction and a way to smear a bad name on anybody that has an alternative theory versus what's being pushed by the mainstream media. So, you know, absolutely. And in closing out tonight, Thomas, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you so much for coming on the show. I would definitely recommend our listeners go check out your YouTube channel, Thomas Sheridan on YouTube. Also, Thomas Sheridan Arts. Dot com. You've got articles, you've got blog posts, you've got different pictures in your gallery there and artwork as well, media events that you've got coming up, also your works, The Druid Code. Now, um, any other gems you can share with us tonight before we close out tonight, Thomas? And thanks again for coming on the show. No, I really appreciate talking to you, and thank you for letting me to uh, give me that opportunity to get out there. Uh, I would just like to say to people, if you're interested in ancient history, my book, The Druid Code, it doesn't only cover Irish mythology. I've traveled extensively throughout Europe. I've looked into the idea of Atlantis uh, giants and all these other things in that context of that. If you want to learn about, like I said, you want to learn about Ireland, there's a great place for you to start in terms of ancient Irish. You know, you could actually see that, you, you, you know, if that's part of your heritage too. Remember that. It's not something that just because you were born in America, it goes your ancestors and my ancestors. And so like so many people reading this, and no matter where you come from, you will have your own version of that if, you're, if your ancestors were Slavic or Nor Norwegian or anything. It's all there. Another thing I would suggest people do is that they, I, I mean, just because, you know, the mainstream media and stuff is all garbage doesn't mean that everything in the mainstream is garbage. There's lots of gems too as well. And learn to be holistically inclined and look at things more creatively. Instead of if hearing an opinion you don't like for the first time, don't just shouldn't you shut everything off. The truth is always never between two extremes. It's always somewhere in the middle. And that's basically putting you in a kind of a magical state you don't have to be afraid of these things you don't have to be worried about them but you have to be wary it's almost like a native bush soul idea even in a modern day this sense of awareness of like my friend i was talking telling you about in england who who noticed these kind of like psychic manifestations on the internet that's almost like the modern version of the pathfinders or the trappers that the native americans had we can do that still and we can we still have those skills and we can still outwit the psychopathic control grid by, by learning them. Well said. And also I'd recommend our audience go to youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. Subscribe, become a member. You'll get access to the latest podcasts absolutely free. And make sure to become a contributing member at leakproject.com. We've got almost 300 full feature podcasts. You'll get access to them, either downloadable as well as streaming, ad free. And uh, also, Thomas, do you have anything else you're working at on the pipeline? Any new books or videos coming out here anytime soon? Well, I am working on a new book, and it's kind of a funny one. It's going to be a biography of a British eccentric, as he was called back in those days, who was basically coming up with a lot of... He was, he was a forgotten figure called John Foster Forbes. And I've been actually going to auctions and everything, buying everything he wrote. And this guy was talking about how the, Atlant the, how the megaliths of Europe were built by highly intelligent people. This was talking about back in the 1920s now. They, you know, they, he was considered a crank and a nut. How Atlantis was probably off the west coast of Ireland. And on Scotland, how basically he, he a lot of things that I'm interested in, he was bringing up back in the day. He, if he was around now, he could be on your show or any other alternative outlet and be considered completely sane and rational. In fact, he wouldn't even be that out there. But yet in his day, he was. 
And uh, I, I want to give this man dignity and I want to actually bring his life story out there to people to show that this guy wasn't a footnote in the history of cranks and eccentrics, that he was actually a visionary in his own way. So that's actually something more, I know it's a strange one, but that's actually, I've become kind of obsessed with this man. Oh, that's great. It'd be neat to read about that, especially because it was a while ago and just bring new fresh light to that. That's fantastic. All right, every yeah, that's great. Well, hey, thanks again, Thomas. It's much appreciated, and hopefully I'll have an opportunity to speak with you again sometime. Okay, all the best, Rex, and thank you for being such a gracious host. You're very welcome. Thomas Sheridan, Black Magic, Sorcery, Evil Empire, Death Cult, Demons, Lesser Keys of Solomon, Psychopaths, Elite Control Grid, Light vs. Dark, Druidism, Iris Mythos, Latest, Leak Project. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Rex Bear. I hope you're having a fantastic day. We have Thomas Sheridan with us, and we dive deep into the Black Magic Control Grid that has laced virtually every network of society. Social media, the entertainment industry, sports, Hollywood, music, almost every faucet of life is under some type of spell. Black sorcery, dark witchcraft. Thomas has been researching the unknown, the occult, for decades. Coming from Ireland, he has a completely different spectrum of knowledge to bring to the table for us today here at the Leak Project. We talk about Druidism. We talk about different forms of magic, good and evil. Thomas also brings to the table names of a couple of entities that are extremely powerful, yet dark and demonic. He feels that many forms of the internet today have been taken over by these entities or are used by these entities as a catalyst or medium for what they feed off of, human emotions. I myself have personally been researching mysticism, the unknown, the occult now for over 10 years. Several years ago, I picked up a used copy of the Lesser Keys of Solomon for research. And it was a very negative feeling when I had that book in the house. Very dark, very low vibrational frequency. And I explained that story in detail in this interview with Thomas as well. And he says, never ever buy a used Goetia, even if it's just for study, because there could be some pretty negative energies attached to that. And that certainly made sense. Now, a lot of really cool things about this interview, folks, is the stuff that Thomas brings to the table, although it's esoteric, it's also extremely scientific. And the interview I had with Neil Slade the other day from BrainRadar.com, where he breaks down the three different parts of the brain, the reptilian, the mammalian, and the super mammalian, this all interweaves together flawlessly. Enjoy the presentation. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine timelord. Become a contributing member at leakproject.com. Make sure to pick up a high quality decal for 10 bucks, free shipping. Help support Leak Project, help support freedom. All right, folks, we have a real treat for you tonight. We have Thomas Sheridan from Thomas Sheridan Arts. Dot com. You can also go to the Thomas Sheridan YouTube channel. Now, Thomas has been researching the unknown, the occult, for years. And the amount of books and films and documentaries and research that he has compiled together just on his website is enough to keep somebody busy for a long period of time. We're going to do our best to get as much information as we can here today at The Leak Project. And it's just an honor to speak with you, Thomas. How the heck are you? Um, great tonight. Thank you, Rex. It's a beautiful evening here in the northwest of Ireland. We're watching the Aurora 
Borealis coming in over Iceland. Perfect night for the interview. Wow, that's incredible. I've got a lot of Irish roots. I've never been there, but I do have a, a castle out there from some ancestry, old lineage, and I'd definitely like to get out there in Northern Ireland someday. Beautiful landscape out there, and uh, that's great that you get a chance to live out there. So have you ever been to the U.S.? Yeah, I lived in the U.S. for 11 years. Okay, what part? Uh, New York, mostly, yeah. Are you glad you're back home? <laughs> well, I, I love America, and I, I love Ireland. It's just that... Uh, you know what the biggest problem with America for me was the climate. It was living in New York was very extreme, very cold winters, very very hot summers, and I don't handle the heat well. So it was, I had a lot to do with it as well. But it was I didn't leave America for any kind of like negative reason. It was just that Ireland called me home again. These things happen, you know yourself. Oh, absolutely. I, I can certainly appreciate that. I grew up in the mountains, and for the past almost twenty years, I've been away from my hometown, home state, and certainly I can't wait to get back there. So I can appreciate that indeed. And if you would, Thomas, just for our audience that hasn't had a chance to hear about you before, if you give them a brief description about yourself, why you decided researching the occult, mysticism, Druidism, etc. Well, specifically with the occult, that started when I was about 11. I'm not kidding you. I got my hand, uh, somehow, I don't know how it happened. I got my hand on a book of, of magic and magic spells. And it was just one of those things as a child that fascinated me. It was also, at the same time, I was very interested in things like astronomy as well. And even later on, electronics, which may sound weird, but we can just, there, are, there are links there too. And so it was just something that always fascinated me. And then I had like the, the usual stage growing up where you're interested in all kinds of paranormal things, ghosts, you know, UFOs, the, the whole lot, demonology, all these kinds of things. You enter your consciousness, you read like, every book you can get. And it was all part of a, a thing from day one to day to, to, to now to try to understand well, what, what being alive is, what you man, what being a human is, and is this, is this software that operates the universe, is it hackable? And over the years, I've discovered it absolutely is, and the methodology for hacking this, the software of the, humor, the universe is magic. So you got into magic and started researching that. Did you get into a specific type? Uh, you know, I mean, there's multiple types yeah. of magic, obviously, just like math. Yeah, well, I never, ever was a member of a magic school or any group like that. But I, the, uh, most of the magic you see, you know, in, in the West, in our, in our lich, in magical texts, is generally based on, you know, Jewish kind of magic, the Kabbalah and that kind of thing, the Lesser Key of Solomon and the Goetia. These are very much sort of rooted in kind of either uh, Middle Eastern Semitic text. And mm -hmm. so that would be basically my first introduction, was learning about things like the Kabbalistic tree, and that kind of thing. And uh, to be honest with you, it never really hit me because I think, well, mainly because it was Middle Eastern, you know, ultimately. And it was, it, it, you know, although it is a proven methodology of working, you know, working magic, it, it had aspects about it that, you know, coming from the Middle East doesn't necessarily fit into a, a Northern European, you know, body, if you know what I mean, or mind, sure. consciousness. So it, then the idea would be to look at magic in almost like a holistic sense, not so much in terms of, shall we say, practicing a specific school, although I do would recommend that to people if they wanted to go down that route, but rather trying to find a, pl a, a applicable, uh, shall we say, ideas within your own culture. And this became a very long and almost arduous learning process. And eventually, it was true, ironically, the work of, you know, Carl Jung's work on synchronicity and his own versions of approaching the unconscious in books like Man and His Symbols, coupled with the American mythologist Joseph Campbell, that combining the two, I started to understand that right, magic was relevant to all, all cultures from very early on. But at the very basic level, there are kind of general, shall we say, tropes, memes, or methods that are common everywhere and this led me eventually to look at the idea of who the druids were and what they what you know what what was their i you know conceptual ideas of magical process about which is my new book my new book the druid code is essentially dealing with but there's various things there's, there's basically the idea of the sacred space the magic circle this seems to go back to a phenomenally ancient part of antiquity in fact in france they've recently discovered basically neanderthal men or people were building inside caves using stalagmites uh, magic circles they found them laid out so there was this idea of creating 
the safe space or the magical space within the enclosed magical area, almost like a, shall we say, a, a, an aspect of reality that's not in this reality. It allows you to step out of this reality in order to focus your will. And that's what magic is at the end of the day. No matter what you can take, you can get, take all the, the theory and methodology and, and all the rule books and everything out. At the end of the day, it's about the absolute concentration of will towards an objective. In its basic sense, magic is taking something in the mind that didn't exist and bringing it into material reality. That could be something as like writing a book, painting a picture, building a chair if you're a carpenter. It didn't exist in the in the, in the real world. You made it manifest all the way up to ritual magic. And the, the ultimate thing is they all follow the same general rules. So, for instance, if you want to achieve a, a magical result, say, you know, say you want your, your boss to give you a, a raise at work, you will go into the same process of doing that writing it out on a paper in the form of a sigil, as you would a carpenter who designs a chair and then brings that chair into reality. But when magic really became alive for me is when it became less, shall we say, esoteric and more reality-based. When I say reality, I mean in like real world terms. When I studied electronic engineering in college, I was always a, a mad electronics. Now I'm talking about analog, pre-digital electronics here. And it soon became apparent to me that the the, the manipulation of electrons through, say, an electronic circuitry by creating, say, a schematic of, say, the circuit and building it was exactly the same process. And it, then magic stopped being an almost mystical thing for me and becoming a very practical thing. And it was almost like in time I developed my own relationship with these magical ideas that was outside the domain of any, any theory as such. Now, did you ever do ritual magic as well, or do you sometimes perform that on like specific times as well to harmonize with, I guess, where the stars are aligned, etc.? Not necessarily, but I do. I do know it works. I haven't actually taken part in a. In a, I've tried. I've tried several rituals, according to the the texts. And yes, they, they, they you know, they see what this idea of the stars being in the sky at the right time, and all these other aspects. A lot of this is all coming down to one thing, the focus of will as an absolute pure stream of energy. Now, for instance, you will have, you might have, a, you know, I have a particularly vicious dagger. It's actually an assassin's dagger. And I, you know, I bought it off a gypsy a few years ago. And this thing is absolutely lethal. I mean, you know, the braid is like 11 inches long. It's self-sharpening when you remove it from the sheath. And it, uh, it, it actually is just frightening to even look at. And does, when you pull it, when you withdraw that dagger, you're, you're actually putting, you're, you're shifting your consciousness at that moment because it inc automatically increases and amplifies the intensity of the sensation towards what you want to achieve. It's about absolute and pure, um, pure ultimate focus and streams of energy you can do it with a painting i've done it with a painting it all depends on what you are artists for instance and i'm an artist myself generally have a better shall we say a uh, qualification to get into a magical state because the act of creation the act of painting the act of drawing of sculpture is already there for them they're already in that 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 zone where someone who's not artistically inclined or necessarily creative, they would absolutely probably have to go through the ritualistic aspects of it, such as a daily incantation and so on, in order to reach a magical state. Very, very, uh, you know, useful practice for someone who wants to move in that in that direction. But yes, I've tried them, I've done them, and I still find that the, the, the best way for me to approach it is to, well, is basically through art. I mean, that's what magic used to be called. It was called the art. And uh, I've had experiences in my life now, not deliberately, where I've painted sort of like streams of consciousness and they've come into manifestation as reality. Now, whether I had predicted them or whether I had created them, I'm pretty much more certain that I created them more than I predicted them, although there are aspects of both. But either way, it, it still comes down to the idea of hacking this operating system of consciousness. You know, I'm looking at your YouTube channel right now. I'm seeing the thumbnails for the videos, and I'm wondering, do you put certain presentations together and put sigils, symbols, etc., throughout your presentations to add to the effect? Well, not 